Ministries Global introduces Apostle Tony A. Kalema to unleash the patent and unsearchable riches in God's Word to give you practical application in your work of faith. For more information, you can contact us on 0778-630265 or 0200 Or you can reach us on all social media platforms under Hackers Doxa. Download our app from Google Play Store or App Store or you can can reach us on our website www.hagusministriesglobal.org. Remember, the word of God is not just a mere message, but a life to be lived. Enjoy. Rabba, 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 Rabba,
su coma sola pando Raliki von Toro para como la madente Maso coma sola pando Marina le von Torombo Huma so comba saya Maso comba satalare Barakama la basso Maraca Rigaba so mando Como so como su tayara Leba como su naba Sipa como su la bracondo Ranika von Toro para como la badombara Malika Masha Kumbasalala Rakeh 
Yes, Olivo Huma Sandara, Ela Sovrano Huma Riba Sante, Makina Moshondo Huma Saya, and the Word of God, Rumale Kosate, and prevail the Mondo Huma Ramaya, the Word prevails in Hartomeli Pondo Huma Randa, and lasting the Pondo Huma Ratombe, Mashaka Masombrano Huma Rivenaka, who walks in all the believe the Rondo Huma Nasadi, Maricaramba Toreba Shada Huvarako Zandele, and Nekofino Tapa Lopan. Thank you for raising a new generation of love, a response to the world that isn't familiar with truth. Bandora Pandu Humana Sunday, Mandela Gari Vonto Humara Benea, Mashonga Manto Huma Dama Sanda, Reko Basho Koma Sitalabe, Ramba Tole Barom Pandu Humara Basaya, Child of God Pray Lo Pandu Humana Sunday, Pray for your generation. Blue manto prendo huma na sante. For the Lord quickens hearts of men. For the Lord quickens hearts of men. Le mando huma na senda. This word draweth love of homo sante ka. It spreads in hearts of men everywhere. In the mighty name of Jesus. Malando repo huma roba senda. Rambele commendo huma rebena sete. Malita rivanto huma rebena saya. Shada God pray di pali pondo huma remenata. Rambato lembo huma roba sarane. Rambela Kadesh on the Humanas and Mele Kobasho Komasaya, Lakonda Ibanto Huma Rebena, Ramba Talaba Hobasho Komaselele, Masele Lembanola, Masele Lembanola, Ramanta Libanoya, Mason of Vando Humanesege, Mosho Kombana Sumbete, Lambato Ibo Huma Rabasonde, Milikando Banto Huma Rabosa, Zabakali Pondo Huma Kazon. Linga da lambe huma sinila Rana koma roba sho koma se Mila daraba huma roba sho ndelela Rako ba sho koma zendele Mali dampe lo pando huma ndelega Randa poli pando huma na sonda Hulu komo shika manela Rana poli pando huma zandari Lido mbe shondo huma nesenta Atonde lali pando hukana ba Basha daba koma sapato le Renkeno lipo huma na zondeta Ima kota vando huma zinula Yalonke rivondo hukana dae Alisu fida haku za kitaya Shanako lepra huma duza nika Mate lava shono huma dima le Renoga mansu bano huka nobe Zavida vota lika vika le Everlasting, we thank you, most sante, for with thee is the fountain of life, and thy life will see lie. Thank you, most shambaya, for in Jesus we lie, and the light was the light of man. Light shines in darkness, and darkness comprehended it no. Lord, we thank you, my shako mande. We thank you for building our lives, O Lord. We thank you, my shako masaya, the influence of your word, the working of your word. Land of my son, daddy, we're constructed. By tree, established and high, never be more. Ula porandera, let tomba shaka mose. For it is really mondo humanea. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trust in the Lord. His heart is established. Let coma sitaye, mashona humanzeke. We pray for the establishment of high hearts of the believers. La coma sandara, let no mashona humanzante, let bandari opondo humara benante, mandara gori bando mena kono jamra bara. Ramba talaba huma roba sombaga, mashaka ba santa laba ya, ba ye koba shoko mandore, leve shoni boy pondo huma rebenenda, ramantari ambodo huma roba na sondega. 
Hulukomo shoko mantale Shaudu ga prelo pandu humasakani Humasakani pani Humasakani pani Lomendo humadan korabe Reko shakaba satayaba Basakaba tayaba Yambala korombo humane sendela Mane sendele pana Romanto pandu humarebe nantelebe Rombido pandu humane sengelebe Mane sengelebe Limonda humaraba sante Mandeli kari vondo huma robinata Masho komo sile prando huma renekene Wilantori prando huma nasani Hesto bless jangu fei Eliso fino huma retanda Retanda matenda Retanda matonda Retanda matendi Ilo sifo shili kaba soido Renat limoni pozondo huma nesana Abalon kado prando huma kibande Masheni voro pindo hukana da zemon trimo Ambalako matrande nea Ramita Masa fando huma da kande, malaso fando huma de kande, masana boni kovoronda ke, maliga ribantra pando huma na sunte, maliko ripondo huma robena koro shambele na. We thank you for shakoma celebrate. Thank you, Lord, for sending the human tremina. Thank you, the last thing God. Thank you for constructing our lives upon your word. We thank you, Lord, Shantaya, like a house built upon the rock. Let wonder whom a Roman ascend. It is established, Lord, when the human trickin' in. It on the wings we rain. More last of Shantaya, come against it, Lord, when the human tremanda. Who will show the power of some right in it? Leave for the Kelly Penoga. Malikamba Lominose. Vazaneki Libra Homba. Yamanek. Kamina huma na sanda manda leba sati vakoba shoko pazengela we lasso ko fando roba here we thank you ko shoko mande we don't balo prando huma na zote somebody go ahead and give thanks to the Lord give thanks to the Lord tell him Lord thank you you are good God thank you mo shaka mbane thank you for making me beautiful on the inside thank you for making me righteous making me holy for giving me forever leko ba shombate ranak libo Thank you for Shandaya, for your natural life, for your natural brain, left from Naya, for your goodness. Thank you for your divine life, Lord Pando Humasake, now unto the King, eternal, immortal. Invisible, the only wise God, the glory and honor. Forever we pray to Him and the Lord. Rano panda raba yakoma shomba de. Rambela koma selebe de. Rema tapa kopa shaka ba kaba da saya. Lamba kata lebo huma raba na sonda ya. Somebody give thanks to God. 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 We pray kopa shaka ba. Taya, give thanks to God to buy, give thanks to God to buy, yes, solo by you, Lambano Kuma Rambana you, Rambana yo Madoba Shakamba de Rebelo Sifondo Robo Akaba Shonder Raika, Masander Raika, Masander Raika, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, Bandarabe, thank you, Lord, Delemesa. Thank you, Lord. Moshe Koma Selebaya, Rapando Baya, Moshe Koma
Praise the name of the Lord. We bless the name of God. Happy new month. It's the fifth day of the 11th month in the Gregorian calendar. We welcome you to this beautiful service, Katsi Hagios Ministries Global and Doxa Life Churches. Yes, we bless God for the new season is unfolded for us. A season of praise. Hallelujah. A season of praise. Glory to God. This is the month of praise. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. You have a reason to celebrate. We've had a long year, a long year that God has been ministering to us so many beautiful things. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Father God, uh, it's a beauty for us to be established in the world. It's a beauty. Every month, God has been unfolding the world so many things. And so today is another beautiful day the Lord has made. We rejoice in glory, Renette. Now, imagine the Bible tells us in Hebrews 13, 15, by him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Hallelujah. So uh, the Bible is telling us it's time to offer the sacrifice of praise in a tremendous way. And you know, each month, God gives us an opportunity to have a specific area of emphasis. And this specific area of emphasis helps us to be established a certain way. Hallelujah. Every day we give thanks. Every day, you know, every morning you give thanks to God for the new day. You know, every other moment we give thanks to God. This is what the Bible says, let us give thanks to God continually. You see that? In Hebrews uh, 13, 15, by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. And I wish you underline the word continually. It says continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. And so thanksgiving, you know, uh, the biggest part of praise is thanksgiving. You understand? So the Bible says the fruit of our lips. He calls it a fruit of the lip. A fruit of the lip. It's a fruit. It's a fruit. In other words, it comes it, it comes from such you know a wealth of substance. That's why I calls it the fruit. It's a fruit. You know, a fruit for fruit to come out, we all know that it goes through a process. You know, a seed is planted and then the shoot comes out and then branches grow out and then the seed, you know, the fruit begins to grow until it ripens. So the Bible says, Thanksgiving, you know, praise, praise, you know, it's the sacrifice of praise is the fruit of our lips. You understand? Fruit of our lips. That's powerful. That's powerful. He says, giving thanks to his name. And so we're saying that every day we give thanks to God, every morning, every hour. And no wonder the Bible tells us in First Thessalonians chapter 5, should be from verse 18. It says, in everything, give thanks. In everything, give thanks. In everything, give thanks. He says, in everything, give thanks. And so, and so Thanksgiving is not limited to a season. And so when we say this is a season of praise and thanksgiving, praise and celebration, it is an emphasis. It is something that God wants to teach us more about. It's something that God is unfolding to us. Hallelujah. Glory to God forevermore. And so it's imperative that we come to a place uh, in our lives where we are ready to give thanks to God every day. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God, praise God, praise God. And so uh, the month of praise, the month of praise, the month of praise. And so I was telling you, uh, you know, we don't give thanks to God in a season. And so we say in November, God is telling us to amplify the praise, to raise the praise. It doesn't mean that every other day, every moment, we don't give thanks to God. Now, let me tell you, Thanksgiving is supposed to be done every moment. Every moment. That's what the Bible says. In everything, give thanks. You see that? First Thessalonians 5, from verse 17, it tells us that pray without ceasing. In verse 18, it says, In everything, give thanks. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. In everything, give thanks. He didn't say for everything. He says in everything. Not for. In. Not for. In everything. Now, in everything means that thanksgiving is a default setting within a believer. You understand? And for the largest part of, of prayer is thanksgiving. For those who love, you know, the prayer of the asking level prayer, where you're asking God, you know, why don't you to do this and you have a... Uh, the biggest part of that is, is, is giving thanks to God. It's, it's, it's our nature. That's how we do it. He says, in everything, because you see, God is good. God is wonderful. God is marvelous. So he says, therefore, let us offer this sacrifice of praise. So 
Every, I encourage you that just, just make it a point in your life that Thanksgiving becomes part of you. But now for this month, God wants us to amplify praise. Amplify praise. Amplify rejoicing and celebration. And so we are going to define many things this month. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll teach you about the seven dimensions of praise. I'll teach you about, you know, really why we praise God. I'll teach you about, you know, the effects of praise. You know, um, it, it's very important. You know, these are some of the things that are supposed to be part of the believer. And that's why most scriptures you see about prayer, he tells you when you pray, he says, with thanksgiving. I hope you, you know that. That's why Philippians chapter 4, when he's explaining about, you know, prayer, uh, you know, if, if Philippians 4 from verse 6, when he says, be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer, supplication and thanksgiving. Prayer, supplication and thanksgiving. You see, thanksgiving is part of that. And so when we don't give thanks to God, it means we've not prayed actually. That's why you see thanksgiving is a big, a big, big, big part of prayer. Because we give thanks to God in everything. We, we don't praise God because our bodies have been attacked. But we praise Him because He's made a supply for our liberty. You understand? We don't give thanks to God because, you know, we don't, we, 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 we don't have cash or we don't, we, we don't have money or we don't have resources. But we give thanks to God because in Christ He's already made them available. So us not having them now or in the manifestation, uh, you know, format, that means that He's not down there. That's why in the New Testament, giving thanks to God, you know, it is more of a lifestyle. So you see, I'm talking about praise, but I'm amplifying thanksgiving. <laughs> you see. So you discover that the largest part of praise actually is thanksgiving. When we clap our hands, or we sing, we do this and the other, we're saying, Lord, thank you, Lord, you're good. We're proclaiming God and, and, and who he is. You see that? So you find that even uh, in, in many of our devotions this month, we're amplifying thanksgiving. You know, there's a lady in the Bible, um, she's called Leah, one of the wives of Jacob. You know, the story of Jacob going to see his uncle Laban and, you know, he reaches the home and, uh, you know, the father tells him, you know, I'm not going to do, you're not going to do this work for free. I'm going to pay you. And he was asking, uh, how do I pay? You said, let me work. Let me work for Rachel. You know, Rachel was a little a young lady, uh, you know, very beautiful, the Bible says. So Jacob loved her. Uh, but later we see after the seven years, um, Jacob uh, Laban wasn't faithful to his word. He went back to their customs, you know, of the land, of the people of the east of the time. He told them, I cannot give you the youngest daughter when, when we have the eldest around. And so tricked him and gave him Leah. And so the Bible says he did not love Leah, but nevertheless, he had received her. So later, when he works the next seven years and gets Rachel, uh, the Bible says he, he gets both of them. Very remarkable story. And so, but the Bible tells us later that, you know, he lost, um, uh, the, the womb of Rachel was closed. You understand? And yet, uh, the, the womb of Leah was open. You get the point? And so the Bible tells us Leah began having children. And she hoped that because she was having children for Jacob, maybe something will happen. That's what the Bible tells us in Genesis 29 from verse 31. I'm just giving you the foundation of how praise comes about. Because the first time we see the Ex explicitly or expressly uh, we see in Genesis 29 especially verse 35 and so Genesis 29 when you begin with verse 31 you realize that the Bible tells us and when the Lord saw that Lear was hated he was hated he opened her womb you see that when he saw that Lear was was hated he opened her womb now that, that's that's remarkable when he says, when he saw that Leah was hated, God opened out. Now, I don't, I don't have time to explain to you why, why it's written that way. But I want you to pick something. The Bible says, but Rachel, but Rachel was barren. Now, these two girls were barren. But the Bible says, and the Lord saw that Leah was hated. He opened her womb. So she began giving birth. The first child she gives birth to was Reuben. The second child is Simeon. The third child is Levi. Now, you realize that Leah, who is hated, is giving birth to remarkable children. I mean, look, look at the stories that surround, uh, you know, the eldest son, uh, Reuben. Look, look at Simeon and the beauties around Simeon. So I'm just giving you a picture because I want to I give you, I want to give you the understanding of how praise comes about. Because praise comes from a place of our affliction. Praise, praise comes from a place of where somebody feels, oh, I don't feel like praising God. I feel things are so hard for me. I feel things are not moving all well for me. He first, you know, he gives birth to Reuben. He gives birth to Simeon. 
You see that? And, and then later, uh, of course, Simeon says, God has had me. So, so Simeon is here. And then the Bible says in verse 34 that, and, and she conceived again and bare sin and said, now this time will my husband be joined unto me. Remember, remember the first child. Oh, this is so beautiful. The first child in verse 32, the Bible says, and Leah conceived and bare a son. And she called his name Reuben. It was Leah naming. It's not Jacob. Now ask yourself a question. Why is Leah naming children? It is the responsibility of the man. That was a mystery there. You understand why, why it's late giving the names to, you know, the children that she gave birth to. And so he's giving the first child, Robin. And the Bible says, after giving birth, he says, uh, for she said, surely the Lord looked upon my affliction. He's using the word affliction. I wish you marked the word affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. Oh, this is so beautiful. In other words, she's having the confidence that now the husband will love her. Because she's enjoined to him with a child. Now verse 33, the Bible says, And she conceived again and bare a son, and said, Because the Lord has heard that I was hated, he has therefore given me this also. She called his name Simeon, <laughs> to testify that God has heard me. Because Simeon means hearing. You understand that God has heard me. Now she's building a relationship now from affliction. She's saying, now my husband loves me. Now I've received my first child. The second child said, now God, I know he hears me. Now look at the third child. He says in verse 34, and she conceived again and bare a son and said, now this time will my husband be joined unto me. Now this is so remarkable. He'll be joined unto me. Now that's, that's the mystery of union. He's explaining how actually people get united. That you, you see, union is a revelation. It's, here it's not just about childbearing. This, this is the revelation that God has heard her. This is an inward experience. Somebody say, now I know that God hears me. It's, it's a revelation. The way somebody say, now I know God loves me. Now I know God hears me. And that's why the Bible tells us that, we, you, know, uh, you know, this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we shall ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, it is a revelation. It's a knowledge. You come to that place where I know God hears me. Why? Because you have a relationship. There are things happening around you, but you're not moved. You're looking at things which happen on the inside because pregnancy happens on the inside. Bearing children starts from the inside. When you receive the word of God, everything starts from the inside. The building up of spiritual substance starts from the inside. Your faith starts from the inside. You to say, I'm going to live in divine health starts from the inside. It's a kind of pregnancy. It's something you carry on the inside. Is the situation good? No. Does the husband love, love Leah? No. Does he speak so well of her? No. Is everything moving on well for her? No. So she says, now he loves me because I've received the revelation. You understand? Now he's joined unto me because I've received the revelation. So I must testify that he hears me. He hears me. So Simeon will always remind Leah that God hears me. Reuben will remind Leah that God loves me. My husband loves me. You understand? Of course, the picture of Christ and the church. I'm not just giving this from the place of revelation. You understand? The literal meaning and then the revelation of meaning. And so please get me in context. Now look, look, look at Simeon. The second child. Look at the third child in verse 34. And she conceived again and bare a son. And now this time will my husband be joined unto me. So at the third child, the child is called Levi. And that's why you see Levi becomes enjoined unto the Lord. That's why all sons of Levi became priests. It is from the tribe of Levi that we see priesthood arising. We see the Aaronic priesthood. We see the Levitical priesthood. You understand? Of course, we have, we have the three clans in, in the Levi tribe. And so all these guys are servants in the house of God. And that's why God told them that I'm not going to give you land because now you are, you've inherited me. I'm your inheritance. Now the revelation comes from here. And that's why we see the next child who is the fourth is the child of praise. Well, we see the savior coming out. You understand? I want you to behold the revelation here. And she conceived again and bare a son. Verse 35. And she conceived again. This is the fourth child. She conceived again and bare a son. And she said, now will I praise the Lord. <laughs> Glory to God. Glory to God. He says, now I'm going to praise God. Why? 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 Now will I praise the Lord. Why? I mean, why is he praising God? Because he knows that the love has come. He knows that the revelation has come and is joined unto him. Now he's giving birth to praise. Ooh. 
this is, you see, praise is a default setting in a born again person. It is a default setting. You know, it's a default app, which is programmed through the word. You understand? Now, the pregnancy here is a programming of the word in a Christian system, in the believer's system. She conceived again. Do you conceive the word? Do you base on the word to praise God? Is your praise based on things God has done or it's based on the kind of pregnancy you've carried and the kind of child that you've brought forth? This child is what I'm calling the default application that tells you you have to praise God. You have to give thanks to God always. You have to, you know, you must have this consciousness that Lord, thank you. You are good unto me. Why? Because I know who I am. You're good unto to me why because you've made me beautiful on the inside you've made me righteous you've made me holy you've made me pure you praise God from the revelation of who he is you praise God from the revelation of the word that has come on the inside of you that you have incubated and have brought forth a child the Bible calls this child praise and that's why it is out of Judah that we see the Savior Jesus Christ coming out because Jesus Christ is a child of praise he's a child of the glory of God you understand he's the son of God the embodiment why would God choose Judah because Judah is praise we live to praise God let everything that has breath praise the Lord I mean this is the amplification of the glory of God look 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 Jesus is coming from Judah Priests are coming from Levi. These are children of the hated wife. These are children of Leah. You understand? I mean, you see, the name Leah means to be weary. You understand? Maybe you go through so many challenges. You, you're, you're weary. You're, I mean, maybe the child was held up for a long time. By the time she came out of the womb, she was tired. So they named her Leah. You understand? And so she carried a certain kind of, you know, burden. Oh, maybe everyone is going to be weary about me everyone i mean the people who go through challenges and they think these challenges are going to define them they think you know everybody's going to reject me and nobody likes them this and the other but when they receive the programming of the word who there is something that works in such a believer who understands that okay i am i'm born of praise i am born of praise I am born of praise. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Now, the Greek word, sorry, the Hebrew word used here for praise. Now, look, look, look at this. There are, you know, there are about eight Hebrew words used for the word praise. And uh, I think in the next service, I'll share with you the seven dimensions of praise. You know, in the spirit realm, why, you know, praise has different sides. You get the point? But the predominant word, which, you know, I would use largely for praise you know, is the Hebrew word Yada. Now, Yada is very remarkable because Yada is used uh, so, so many times in the, old, in the Old Testament. You understand? It's used about 114 times. And uh, that word, praise. You understand? So it's used so many times. It can use, it can mean thanksgiving. It means, you know, confession. When you're confessing the goodness of God, you're confessing the beauties of God. And so this word could mean thanksgiving, could mean confession. It means so many things. You understand? To be thankful, the same word. And so what I want you to notice here is that when, when, you know, as a child of God, it's important to have a revelation of how, how this comes about. You understand? How, how does praise come about? Because what I'm sharing with you is it's just a little, a, a, a little but very, very important foundation. You understand? And so he says that he's using the word yada, which means to, literally it means to revere or to worship. Especially with, with the extended arms. You know, when you lift up your arms... And, and worship, praise and worship. You understand? That, that is the essence of worship. Now, today you realize that the word praise combines both adoration, you understand? And, and singing unto God in a joyful celebration. So don't be uh, confused when we say we're going to have a praise rally and we are doing many things. We are doing, you know, we're singing songs of celebration. We are singing songs of adoration. We are singing songs of, of prayer. We are singing all different kinds of songs. So the primary word, what some people call worship, because now worship may not mean to sing. <laughs> you understand? Right? So we're going to have praise and worship. Sometimes people think, okay, worship literally does not mean to sing. And I've told you this several times. Worship means to lay prostrate. Worship means to, to give yourself. Worship means to, to open up your spirit. 
for you know spirit to spirit fellowship with God. You understand? But praising now is a part where music comes out. You understand? What well, music can come out, thanksgiving can come out, so many things can come out, as we shall be sharing later. I just wanted to give you a broad understanding of the word praise that you may know, okay, what does it mean to praise exactly? So praise could mean, uh, you know, uh, could mean to, to, to worship. You understand? Lifting up your hands, uh, you know, could, could mean, you know, a clap offering, could, could mean so many things. But again, in the New Testament, the word praise is defined as a thanksgiving offering. You understand? A thanksgiving offering made through confessions of affirmation. There must be confessions of affirmation. You must affirm through what you, what you say. You say, oh Lord, you're good. Oh Lord, you're wonderful. You understand? Of course, if you put it in a, a lyrical, musical form, we've come to give you praise. Hallelujah, we've come to give you praise. Hallelujah, man. You understand? We've come to give you praise. Now, you can put it in a, in a song format, but you see, even when you speak words of, words of praise are words of affirming. You are affirming, you're giving thanks to God, but it's through a confession. That confession could be musical or it could be through an affirmative speech. You understand? It could be musical or an affirmative speech. It will be what sometimes we call a laudatory discourse. Something that you speak louder. You say, Lord, thank you. Oh, glory to God. Oh, wonderful is your name. Oh, beautiful is your name. That is praise. You understand? I give him some praise. Some people think, okay, praise just, just singing a, to, to God. Singing a quick song. <laughs> you understand? So praise isn't just about singing a quick song. A quick, loud, you know, gospel song. But it also means reverent worship, adoration, and honor of God. You understand? Of course, our body posture while praising God is very important. And that's why you see in our divination, uh, lifting up of hands is very critical. Lifting up hands is a way of honoring God. Clapping from your heart with your hands is a way of honoring God. You understand? Laying prostrate before God or even dancing in a joyful celebration. You understand? Dancing in a joyful celebration is thanksgiving, or rather, is praise. You get the point? It's praise. Dancing in a joyful celebration is praise. Laying prostrate before God is praise. Honoring Him by, you know, lifting up your hands is praise. Clapping your hands from your heart and you know you know what you're doing is praise. You understand? Oh, this is beautiful. This is beautiful. So in other words, um, you see, when you look at the pictures given you concerning Judah, the fourth child of Leah. Now Judah, the fourth child of Leah, gives us a picture that Praise is actually a fruitfulness. <laughs> you understand? That's what I was telling you. And that's why in, 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 in Hebrews 13, 15, the Bible says, Let us therefore offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips. It is called a fruit. You understand? Because praise is the testimony of our fruitfulness in Christ. Now, that fruitfulness does not just relate with physical material things. That maybe I've, I've got money from somebody, or maybe uh, I've, I've received a car, or I, I got learned, you know, I, 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 got, I got something material, and so I'm going to praise God. No, 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 no. Praise starts from our spiritual fruitfulness, you understand? So when we say that praise is the testimony of our fruitfulness in Christ, we are addressing our fruitfulness, spiritual fruitfulness. You know, you know being forgiven, being loved, you know, being the righteousness of God. You know, having a consciousness of, of, of no, no imputation of sins. Having an understanding that you're healed. That, that, that is fruitfulness. And so we are praising God from the place of fruitfulness. Because praise is, is declaring. We are declaring that God has already done great things in our lives through Christ. Even before anything is made manifest. Because you see, praise comes from a spiritual fruitfulness. Praise testifies that Jesus has forgiven us. Jesus has loved us eternally. Jesus has paid the price for our healing and our divine health. Jesus became poor that we may become rich material. You understand? In other words, he becomes the foundation of everything. And so when you're praising God, you're testifying that Jesus has got it. Oh, glory to God. You've done it all. 
Hallelujah. For all you've done. You've done everything. You've procured my salvation. You've procured my healing. You have procured everything. You have purchased everything. I am free from sin. I'm free from Satan. I'm free from sickness and disease. I'm free from pain. Oh Lord, thank you. I praise you. Glory to God. I praise you. Glory to God. I am free. Glory to God. So praise is a faith declaration. I'm giving you many definitions of praise. Praise is a faith declaration. It's a faith declaration and joyful celebration of God's goodness towards us. So it's a it's it's a faith declaration. You're declaring that, oh, thank you, Lord. For I am healthy, for I am wealthy. Glory to God. I praise your name. Hallelujah. But if you're weak in your body, you praise him because it's true. You see, fruitfulness is a spiritual reality. But it can be made manifest. You understand? It can be made physical. Spiritual things can be made physical. You understand? If someone has believed that they're forgiven, it's the reason why they forgive others. You understand? When you forgive others, it impacts the physical life. You understand? So our fruitfulness that is spiritual can be made physical. You understand? You cannot say, I'm forgiven, I'm loved, and then you hate your brother, and then you, you hold grudges against people, and then you, 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 you hold every kind of funny thing in your heart. Yet you're forgiven. That means you do not have that revelation. You may think you're forgiven, but it ends in your head. It has to take up your heart. So praise comes from a place where there is fruitfulness. Do you want to live a life of praise? I mean, you be fruitful. Fruitfulness we're talking about is to know who God is. To know who you are in Christ. Not just to know, but to celebrate it. They say, Lord, thank you. <laughs> Glory to God. I am forgiven. You know, one of the things that I told you when I was growing up is... Um, Every major revelation I'll receive, I'll throw a party for myself. You know, I'll celebrate, say, Lord, thank you. And I remember when I go to understand that I'm forgiven, you know, I'm loved. I mean, there was a, there was a party I threw myself, you know, in, in my room, like, oh, Lord, thank you. And I remember, you know, this revelation of no imputation of sin, it blew me up, you know. <laughs> it blew me up, but I know that God, namely that God was in Christ. You remember 2 Corinthians 5 uh, from verse 18, that namely that God was in Christ. Reconciling the whole world unto himself, not imputing sins unto men. When that scripture entered my system, it was like, Whoo! Glory to God! Glory to God! Blessed is the man. That's when I saw when I saw Romans chapter 4. You know, I came to verse 7, I came to verse 8, and verse 9. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord will not impute sin. Shall not impute sin. Like, what? Even as David describes the blessedness of a man unto whom the Lord imputes righteousness without work, saying, The blessed is the man unto whom the Lord. Will not, shall not impute sin. Ha! Psalm 32. That was powerful. I read it and the master is like, whoo, glory to God. This is fruitfulness now. So I don't have to be condemned. I don't have to keep guilt and condemnation. You know, I know God loves me. I know, I know he's forgiven me. I know he does not record my sins. Man, that, that blew me up. Now, that's the fruitfulness I'm talking about. You cannot fail to praise God with such an understanding. Because you see, praising comes from fruitfulness. When you're spiritually fruitful, you will praise God. Even when you wake up and you feel there's so many things which are pending, you know, you forget about everything and say, whoo, let's praise, let's do some praise here. Ha <laughs> glory to God. Glory to God. You can praise God through thanksgiving. You can praise God, God through, you know, playing a song to, for, to do what we call a joyful celebration. You can do a joyful celebration. That's praising God. Joyful celebration. You do it alone in your room. You play music and you dance. You say, Lord, thank you. Why are you praising God for who he is in your life? He has made you fruitful. So you declare it. You declare it through a joyful celebration. And oh boy, when the mystery and the revelation of divine health don't know me. Ha <laughs> ha. Glory to God. Glory to God. I remember that party vividly because it's more recent. That could have been about, oh, we're entering 2008. <laughs> it's a bit more recent. Uh, for those of you, that's, that's, about, that's, about, that's about 15, 16, 15, 16 years ago. Yeah, yeah, about that. Uh, that's, that's a bit more recent because, oh, that party, I remember it. I remember it. I remember it. I was, I was, I was in, at the university, you know. <laughs> oh, glory. Look, let me tell you. Let me tell you. Praise, praise comes from fruitfulness. Nobody should lie to you. But the fruitfulness is what we call the spirit of fruitfulness. You understand? You're fruitful. I mean, on the inside, you know it. Let me tell you, you cannot praise God unless you recognize every good thing which is in you in Christ. If you want to praise God based on what you're going through on circumstances, oh, circumstance, you are not going to praise Him. 
you are not going to praise him. You understand? If you're waiting for things to change, then you have a praise rally. You are deceived. Praise comes from the revelation of our fruitfulness in Christ. That's why in Philemon 1.6, he says that the communication of your faith may be effectual. Through the full knowledge, he uses the word acknowledgement, which means full knowledge of every good thing which is in you in Christ. Whew! Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You see, I told you that praise is a sacrifice. You understand? There's so many division. Praise is a sacrifice. And I'll tell you, in the Old Testament, the men who had the understanding that praise is a sacrifice. And one of those men was David. Because you see, in the OT, people were used to give thanks to God when they would bring an offering. A lamb offering. You understand? An offering without blame, you know, a lamb without blemish. And so they used to uh, offer animals. And so but time came when some received revelation, people like um, David, they began receiving revelation that, ah, he's praising God about offering animals, it's about the heart. And so you see, it's amazing that in, in the Old Testament, we have so many pictures of people praising God for who he is, not, not for what he would do or what he had done, but for who he is. And I, I see pictures of David and a few other ministers who have that revelation. You see that? That's why you see when you read in Psalms 50, we write down the scripture, Psalms 50 verse 14. The Bible tells us, offer unto God thanksgiving and pay thy vows unto the Most High. He says thanksgiving, you know, is an offering. Now the offering of thanksgiving is actually praise. He wants that. Now Psalms 50, the same chapter, verse 23, the Bible says, Whoso offereth praise glorifies me. And he's explaining what this means. And to him that ordereth his conversation aright, I will show the salvation. So whoso offereth praise glorifies me. What is the praise? The praise is thanksgiving nation alone. You understand? And so, um, and that's why when David sinned, I remember, you know, he, he told God that you, you, you do not desire, you don't delight in burnt offerings. If it was so, uh, I would offer them. You understand? Time came when David, you know, David had a relationship with God, which, has, which was beyond the OT. Because the old covenant was based on animals. But now David, that's why he's the same man who describes the new creation by saying, you know, blessed are they, are those whose sins are forgiven, whose iniquities are covered. You see that? Saying that blessed are those unto whom the Lord imputes righteousness with no sin. It's David who talks like that. That's why you see, David was a prophet, but David's relationship with God was beyond an average OT Christian. You understand? Actually, David's relationship with God was even better than that of many New Covenant Christians. I'll be honest with you. And that's why he said that the sacrifice of the Lord, a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, thou despisest not. Why is David talking that way? It's because he knew that actually if he would take an animal to God, it wouldn't make sense. <laughs> you understand? It did not make sense. And so he said the sacrifice of the Lord, Psalm 51, you know, when you read uh, verse 16 and 17, from actually 15, it says, Behold, iniquity of my mother conceived me, blah, blah, blah. 16, and then he explains what that means. And then 17, it says, But the sacrifice of the Lord, a broken spirit, a contrite heart. You see that? Broken spirit, broken spirit, contrite heart. So he knew that it's about the heart. When the heart offers praise, wow. The heart offers praise to God. The heart offers praise to God. It's so powerful. You understand? As a child of God, it's, it's important to know that praise comes from the well of your heart you understand and that's why david knew that you see in verse 15 i was telling you psalms 51 from verse 15 oh lord open thou my lips and my mouth shall show forth praise thy praise why was david concerned about praise why was he concerned about praise because he knew it is the only way he would offer to God. And that's why in verse 16 he says, For thou desireth not sacrifice. He's talking about animal sacrifice. Oh, as else I would give it. Thou delighted not in burnt offering. Imagine he's in a generation where men offer burnt offerings, right? But David had a revelation that even if God told them to do that, that's not his desire. <laughs> can you imagine the things God can tell somebody? He says, they get to discover that's not God's desire. He told you that because you're young. When you grow up, he won't tell you such a thing. So David, you know, I know he, he could have contradicted with many in his generation because he didn't live entirely under the co old covenant. <laughs> you understand? And that's why one time uh, he, he, he commits a sin by counting the number of children of Israel. 
and then God had forbidden that and the prophet comes to him and says David okay God is giving you these options what are you going to choose David said I would rather fall in the arms of the living God <laughs> than to face the wicked he knew that God is merciful God is gracious so he said okay I'm going to fall in that arms of the living God. As much as some prophets said, it is a dreadful thing to fall in the arms of the living God. David had a revelation. He had a revelation. And that's why in verse 16, in Psalm 51, verse 16 he says, that for thou desireth not sacrifice, else I would give it. He says, thou delightest not in burnt offerings. But they were giving them anyway. Why was he contradicting? Because he had a relationship with God beyond the legal system. His relationship with God was based on the heart. That's what the Bible describes him as a man after God's own heart. He's a man who lived above his generation. He could have made mistakes that everyone would make, but his wins were beyond his generation. That's why you see in the Bible, men are defined by their wins in the Lord, not by their mistakes. That explains why in some, or rather in Hebrews 11, when we're being showed the great gallery of, of men of great faith, men and women of great faith, you don't see mistakes being mentioned. You understand? The Bible will tell you women receive their dead. See the point. The Bible will tell you they put a thousand to flight. The Bible tells you by faith, Abraham moved from you know uh, from, from 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 Haran and he moved to to the city that God had ordained for him. And so what I'm saying here, David was a blessed man. Now, as a child of God, you need to know that praise is a function of the revelation of God from your heart. It is true you're going through a lot. It is true you could be having financial struggles. It is true you could be having this and the other. Your body could be weak. It is true this may not be running well. Your career may be in a balance. Your, your, you know, your business may not be running so well. But it, let me tell you, it is true that God is a revelation in your heart. Praise is the revelation from your heart. And that's why in verse 17, David says the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. And he says, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou will not despise. Of course, there are things God can never despise. Hope you know there are things God despises. There are sacrifices God despises. Yes, that's true, the Bible says. But there are things that somebody does and God cannot despise. <laughs> oh, glory to God forever. Glory to God. Now, look at how David concludes in verse 18 and 19. He says, do good in thy good pleasure and to Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shall thou be pleased with a sacrifice of righteousness. Sacrifice of righteousness. With burnt offerings and a whole burnt offerings. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. Why? Because there's a sacrifice of righteousness. The sacrifice of righteousness is praise from the heart. The sacrifice of righteousness is the fruit of the lips beyond circumstance or what somebody's going through. The sacrifice of righteousness is the revelation that one has in the heart. That's why we are saying that praise is a sacrifice. Because we do not adore, worship, thank God or celebrate Him only for the good things that have happened in our life. We praise and celebrate God for who He is in us and what He has already done in Christ. You understand? And now that is the only attitude that can enable you to praise God continually regardless of what you're going through. That is the essence of Hebrews 13, 15. By him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. Not periodically, not seasonally. He says continually. That is the fruit of our lips. Fruit of our lips. Giving thanks to his name. Remember the fruit of the lip comes from the womb comes from something conceived and developed. The word of God conceived just like we see Judah in Leah's womb. She is conceived, she conceives you know, a son and the son grows and then she names him praise because the son is a fruit of the lip. You understand? Our Lord Jesus is the fruit of the lips of God and that's why it's the word of God made manifest. And the fruit of God's lips is the word. So when the word is made manifest that is called praise. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I think now you understand why Apostle Paul and Silas could easily pray, worship and praise God in the midst of the prison cell. Even when they were still under chains, the Bible says that their legs and hands were 
I mean, their, their legs were, were chained. You understand? They were chained. I mean, they were, they were, they were bleeding. They had been beaten. They had wounds. But the Bible says they praised God. And the other prisoners had them singing and praising God. Who does that? If you're looking at circumstances, let me tell you, sometimes we need to challenge ourselves. You know the people who say, me, I can praise God in this circumstance. Do you know that some of us can't even pray when we're going through challenges? That explains to you that you love beholding lying vanities. You understand? And that's the fact. If you cannot pray or praise God when you're going through troubles and crises, crises of life, it means, it means your relationship with God is still circumstantial. This is a hard truth, a bitter truth. Your relationship with God is still circumstantial. It is not revelational. It is not based on who God is. It is not based on who you are in Christ. It is simply based on what you have on the outside. And that is dangerous. We can have a relationship with God based on things we're going through. As much as things we're going through affect how we praise God. Because once we allow these things to enter our heart, definitely our prayer life is going to be inclined on things we're going through. That's why when someone is in trouble, some people can't pray. You understand? That's why the Bible calls praise a sacrifice. It is not coming from the place of blissfulness. It is true you can praise God when you, when you know, that's what the Bible says that is anyone merry? Let him, let him sing psalms. Let him praise God. Let him, let him sing. You understand? But it doesn't end there. Praise is deeper than a joyful celebration. Praise is not just about a joyful celebration because of the things that have happened. You've received a promotion, your business is going on well, you know, you're, you're super healthy, you're super wealthy, so you praise God, you praise God. That's okay, but that's, that may not be a sacrifice. A sacrifice means that you're offering something that is unpleasant to your emotions, unpleasant to your mind, but it's coming from your spirit. That's why the Bible is calling it a sacrifice. I hear me, child of God. It is called a sacrifice. Sacrifice. Do you understand? A sacrifice, a kind of slaughter. When there's a sacrifice, there's a particular kind of death that has to happen. Now, that kind of death that has to happen is what amplifies praise. Praise makes more sense when you are going through more challenges in your life. Did you hear what I said? Praise makes much more sense when you're under crisis. That's why you see Apostle Peter, or rather Apostle Paul and, and Silas could easily praise God when they were in the midst of the prison cells. Remember, they imprisoned them for no reason. They just rebuked a demon. They cast out a devil from a soothsaying girl. But because the owners of that little girl had lost business, so they caused an uproar and they, they, beat, they beat Paul and Silas. They threw them in prison. You understand? Some of us can't stand to suffer for the gospel. We can't suffer for good. When you've done good things and people are accusing you, you can't accept to suffer it. Yeah, the Bible says, I mean, it is a good thing to suffer for the righteousness sake. Do you understand? Most of us are programmed to only suffer, you know, for things that, you know, we did. You understand? If you've done something and then you're suffering, you're like, ah, now that is good justice. Justice is being laid on me. <laughs> What if you suffer when you've done nothing wrong? You suffer innocently. You suffer righteously. The Bible says God loves somebody, I mean, who suffer righteously. That's what the Bible says. It is good to commit your soul to a faithful God who judges all things righteously. It's okay. So when you're accused, sometimes rejoice, celebrate God, thank God. You're not thanking God because of the bad things that are happening to you. No, you're thanking God because He's giving you grace. You're thanking God because you're above it. You're thanking God because you're above disillusionment. You're above, you know, uh, you know, you're above slander. You're you're above, you know, malice. You're above, you know, you're you're above any kind of thing that could could come your way. So we give thanks to God. We say, Lord, thank you. It is a sacrifice. Come on! Embrace praise as a sacrifice. Are you going through trouble? Praise God. Praise God. Give thanks to God. You know, 
Play wonderful music. Celebrate God. Dance like this never before. Don't dance only when good things have happened in your life. Let me tell you, this is a beautiful exercise. Are you going through a crisis? I mean, look at Paul. When they praised God, they prayed, they sang. The Bible says there was an earthquake in that prison. Look at that. How would praise release such power? It's because the scripture tells us in Psalms 22 verse 3 that God inhabits the praise of Israel. God inhabits the praise of his people. He inhabits it. Because praise releases power. Do you understand? So child of God, look at praise as a sacrifice. Oh yeah. Glory to God. Let me tell you. If equipment can praise God, look at it this way. The Bible tells us that you know, we praise God with equipment. You understand? Instruments of music. You see that? The present day we have the guitars, you know, we, we have the saxophone, we have, uh, you know, the keyboard, we, we have the piano, we have, you know, so many other instruments that can praise God. And the Bible tells us that actually praising God through instruments is beautiful. How about them from your heart? How about praise and sacrifice? If things without life can praise God. I mean, look at, look, look at how the... The Levites lived. Uh, you remember in the times of Moses, the Levites were serving in the temple. Of course, it was a tabernacle. There was no temple at the time. You get the point? But the Bible tells us that, you know, uh, David looked at the order of, of, of Levites through Moses and organized the Levitical choir in such a way that the people who had been selected to just praise God by playing equipment. That those who would sing, only sing in the those who play equipment. You understand? And that's why there's a scripture, uh, I love the scripture, First Chronicles, First Chronicles 23 verse 5. We use it a lot in the, in, in the school of music, in the ministry. Uh, Moreover, 4,000 were potters, and then 4,000 praised the Lord with instruments which I named, said David, to praise therewith. Now, the people who, you know, were supposed to praise God with instruments. Now, look at it this way. If instruments which do not have life can praise God, can be programmed by a person. Because of the anointing that is released upon the chords that are being played, music through sound can praise God. Do you understand? You know, uh, it, it's beautiful that David assigned 4,000 people to specifically praise God <laughs> through sounds of instruments. It's, it's, it's wonderful. I mean, look at Psalm 33. Uh, Psalm 33 is so beautiful when you read from verse 1. But I'll pick up verse 2 and 3. Psalms 33, verse 2 and 3. Uh, Praise the Lord with harp. Sing unto him with a psaltery and instruments of ten strings. Sing unto him a new song. Play skillfully with a loud noise. Glory to God, man! Of course, these are ancient instruments being mentioned here. Of course, some of them are still around, like, uh, like the, uh, we, we have the harp around, but most of them are being replaced. We have the keyboard, we have, you know, uh, of course, the, the, ancient, uh, the, ancient, the ancient keyboard, and then we have the piano, we have the guitars, you know, we have the saxophone, we have the flute, we have the, you know, so many, so many equipment today. But especially uh, uh, equipments that are used for praising God are what we call string, string-like equipment. You understand? Those that are string, like you'd see a guitar, very beautiful for praising God. It, it plays some nice sound. You see uh, a, a keyboard does too, beautifully. And so, um, you know, when you use a guitar, psaltery, these are very important when you're, when you're praising God, especially with skill and the action of the Spirit. Now, two things play out when we're praising God with equipment. There must be the skill. That's why there's training. You remember in the Levitical choir, uh, you know, every, every member had to be trained for at least five years, uh, you know, through music. You understand? Even those who play equipment, and, and, and for two reasons, to get the message, you know, because music is a message, as I'll be sharing later. Mus music is when you express the message. You understand? The message which is being ministered on the pulpit, the message of the Lord. Music is preaching, you understand? Music is, you know, is, 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 is teaching. And so you'll find that sometimes people take uh, the music ministry to be uh, just a simple helps ministry. As much as it's a helps ministry, but it's a powerful ministry in the Lord. That's why it needs, it needs thorough training. You understand? Thorough training for the purposes of skill. Skill is very important in the Bible. But we also have the unction of the Spirit. The unction of the Spirit relates with the gift of God working in you. 
So on one hand, we have the gift of God, which stirs up the anointing through your relationship with God. And then on the second part, we have the skill, the training part. You understand? So if we could have skilled people playing equipment, and, and then these people are anointed, wow, music can be remarkable. Music can be amazing. And so that's why you see in the, the, the music school, the ministry, we put a lot of emphasis on training. You understand? And so the, the, this scripture, Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 6, you can write it down as well. Second Chronicles 7, verse 6. And, and the priests waited on their offices, the Levites also, with the instruments of music of the Lord, which David the king had made to praise the Lord. Now Im imagine, David was an inventor. He made, he, made, he made instruments. You know, sometimes I look at Christians who cannot be creative enough to be able to make something. And, and they feel being born again means to be idle and disorderly. It doesn't mean creativity. Yet, you know, people who have the spirit can be very creative. Now, look, look at David. David was an inventor. David was, was, a, was a manufacturer, was a maker. So he made instruments of music. You understand? So the Bible is telling us that the Levites also with the instruments of music of the Lord, which David the king had made to praise the Lord. Because his mercy endureth forever. Look at the reason why he's praising God. He says, because his mercy endureth forever. When David praised by their ministry, and the priest sounded the trumpet before them, and all Israel stood. So this means that even if David was not playing the equipment, but David gave the instruction, you understand, David gave the training through other elders, and then many had been appointed to play music. Wow. And, and, and this reminds me of uh, what we call classical music. Uh, some of you, um, uh, some people, there's a music they call it jazz music, you know, jazz, jazz. You're know, playing equipment, playing sound, jazz sound to just relax. That's why you see there's power in music. Especially if music is played by the unction of the spirit. You remember uh, the, the, the scenario of Elisha when he had been disoriented by the other kings who seemed to have offended him. And, and when you read him, and should be uh, Second Kings chapter 3. Around there, uh, you know, he had been upset, so he had to ask for a minstrel, somebody to play the harp. And, and you know, when, it, when, when this person played the harp, the Bible says the hand of the Lord came upon Elisha. You understand? It's not that the music broke the hand of the Lord, no, but, uh, but, but the harp, that sound which we're talking about, played by an anointed person. It releases chords that glorify God and condition a man's spirit to receive from God. You understand? And so music creates an atmosphere, but music could be through singing words, but it could be through sound. You understand? That's why I believe that people who are called to the music ministry and can excel, can preach the gospel and teach the word through music. You understand? And, and if this ministry is taken so seriously, you realize that there can be a greater force of influence in people's lives. I mean, look at David. When Saul was possessed by an evil spirit, they had to look for somebody who would play. Aha, who played play an instrument very well. And David was anointed. So when he played, the evil spirit left him. Why? It created a beautiful atmosphere, you know, that, that, that discomforted this demon. So you need to understand the power of praising God through sounds through instruments of music you understand so child of God uh, don't don't take these things for granted when we're learning to praise God sound praises God instruments praise God you understand blessed be the name of the Lord and then ask yourself why am I preaching most of the times and I love playing sounds in the background it's because such sound is programmed to create a sudden environment you understand I love it it's, it's, it's beautiful. It, oh, I, I love it. I love it. And I know you love it too. You understand? And so, you see, I was telling you, if instruments, if sound can praise God, how about you? How about you? How about you? Because when you look at the divine order of music under, you know, David's ministry, uh, you know, because David was a king, but he was also, he was also a priest. You understand? He was, he was a priest of revelation. He wasn't, um, you know, he wasn't an ordained priest because he didn't come from Levites. He wasn't a Levite. You understand? And so some people ask themselves, why would David sacrifice? Why would he enter the temple and he would eat showbread? Because showbread was for only Levites. Now David came to the temple and ate bread and even shared with people he was with. It's amazing Jesus mentioned this same thing. 
he was asking, you know, the, the, the Jews, the Pharisees was asking them, did, did, did you read? Have you heard that David entered the temple <laughs> and, and ate showbread and also shut the people he was with? Why was Jesus bringing such a conversation? Because you see, I told you that David lived beyond his generation. David knew spiritually he was oppressed. He wasn't just a king. And David was a wonderful musician. He was a prophet as well. So David was a king. He was a prophet. He was a priest. And he was a servant. I mean, look at that. King, prophet, priest, servant. <laughs> you understand? He was also a judge. So look, look, look at such a man. And that's why it is David who created what we call the divine order of music in the Bible. It began with Levites. On one occasion, you know, he gets a group of 38 of them. When you read 2 Chronicles chapter 14, chapter 8, sorry, 2 Chronicles chapter 8, gives us a picture of David getting 38 folks. You know, they were coming, of course, these were Levites. And then uh, he, he categorized them in four groups. She wants that. 24,000 had to work in the house of the Lord to do different things. Then 6,000 uh, were officers and judges over the people. And then 4,000 were potters used to serve around the temple. You understand? But again, he had to ordain 4,000 folks to praise the Lord with instruments. Wow. <laughs> they were just specialized to play music. They're so beautiful. They're so beautiful. They're so beautiful. Glory to God for a while. So, you see, playing, playing of music instruments, playing instruments of music, is it, not just done by, you know, idle people in church. You know, somebody's idle, they're doing nothing, and so <laughs> they get, oh, let's, let's play equipment. No, this is a blessed ministry, a wonderful ministry done by God. You want to, that's why such people who are to play uh, equipment must be trained in the word of God, must understand the pattern of the message in the ministry. You understand? Because they need to play these instruments skillfully, but they also have to play them under the unction of the Spirit. Under the unction of the Spirit. Because in playing music, you're ministering, you're releasing the Word of God through chords. You're releasing the message of grace, glory, and immortality through chords of instruments. When you play chords on a guitar, you're doing that. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I, I remember David in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 19. And the Bible says, And the Levites of the children of Kohite, Kohathites, of the children of Kohites, stood up to praise the Lord, God of Israel, with a loud voice. <laughs> this was under Jehoshaphat's time. You remember, it's amazing that Moses began the pattern. David established the pattern. Solomon amplified the pattern. Jehoshaphat maintained the pattern. It's amazing. Because 2 Chronicles chapter 20, I mean, uh, Jehoshaphat takes, you know, the children of Israel for war. He, he takes able bodied men for war. And, and the Bible says he had to appoint men to sing. He had to appoint them to play music. Why he knew victory was lying in praising God. You understand? So if Jehosh Jehoshaphat could maintain the order of David, which Solomon also practiced, it shows you. It shows you that music is very powerful. You understand? Very, very, very powerful, especially the usage of equipment. Please, I'm just encouraging you find meaning in these things. Don't just see people playing music, uh, you know, in a church service and you think it's just like that. Don't be part of church and, you know, maybe you're a music minister or you play equipment and you think you're just, you know, doing something that is simple. You know, you're extending the influence of the word through chords. You extend the influence of the word, you're in extending the message. You're extending the message as you're playing these chords on, on a guitar, as you're playing them with a, with a jazz band, as you're playing them on a keyboard. There's something you're doing. You're releasing something. The message is being released through chords. It's, it's establishing an environment that is different. It's, creating, you know, it's releasing the presence of God. It is releasing prophetic chords that can align man. It's releasing something. You understand? Oh, glory to God. I love talking about the Levitical choir because there's so many things that, you know, about music. <laughs> you know, I, I remember uh, there's this common place in First Chronicles chapter 15 when, again, David was interested in, in showing us something very powerful. The Bible tells us, uh, when we begin in verse 2, and then David said, uh, none ought to carry the ark of God but the Levites. 
for them as the Lord chosen to carry the ark of God and to minister unto him forever. Now David was emphasizing things that Moses had instructed. You understand? Saul didn't care about these things because he had no relationship with God a certain way. Now David, whose heart was after God, had to pick up these things. He said, you know, Levites have to carry. Nobody's supposed to play with this ark. The ark of the covenant has to be carried. Has to be carried by Levites alone. You understand? And that's why you see, uh, true praise unto God is only done by those who are born again. Because the Levites uh, were representing a class of people who had a relationship with God. The way you see in the New Testament, we have everyone born again. You understand? Everyone born again now can praise God with revelation, can praise God with understanding. You, you get the point? And that's why you see, I was telling you earlier that uh, to serve in the Levitical choir, you had to be trained for up to five years. You get the point? And, and, and that's why they had to be instructed. When you, when you read in First Chronicles, in chapter 25, it also explains a lot about this. Those of you who have, of course, uh, been part of the music ministry uh, in Haggis know all these things. But it's important to know them in context. In First Chronicles 25, verse 7, the Bible tells us, So the number of them with their brethren that were instructed in the songs of the Lord. So instructed, instruction means teaching. You understand? Music ministry is is a ministry that teaches the word. That's why you see, music is supposed to come from the message preached on a given pulpit. Music is an amplification of the message of Christ minister in a given ministry. You understand? And that's why music ministers are encouraged not to sing what they want to sing. They sing in line with the message. They sing the message. Not in line with the message, they sing the message that is preached on that given pulpit. So music is the extension program of God of the message of Christ being preached in that given ministry or on that particular altar. You understand? This explains why, you see, when David was organizing the music ministry, he put it under three leaders. You remember those three leaders? When you read in 1 Chronicles chapter 25, we see David explaining about, you know, the three leaders, Asaph, Jebuthan, and Heman. Second, uh, second, 1 Chronicles 25. 1 Chronicles chapter 25. I'll just pick for you verse 6. All these were under the hands of their fathers, uh, hand of their father for song in the house of the Lord, with cymbals, psalteries, and harps, for the service of the house of God, according to the king's order, to Asaph, Jebuthan, and Heman. Now, these three names just teach us something about music. And, and I want just to re echo something some of you may not be aware that you see in the Levitical choir, which David established, it had three chief rulers. Because when, when you have a minister of music, sometimes uh, people are so many and you need to create what we call bands or units. Now, every unit must have a leader. That's how, that's how David did it. You understand? And so he appointed three leaders. He appointed us of Jeduthan and Heman. You understand? Because these three represent the ordination of the music ministry. What the music ministry does. Because under these three were captains of hosts. Now when you read in 1 Chronicles chapter 25, let me just borrow something from verse 1. I didn't read for you verse 1. I read for you verse 6. Now verse 1 tells us uh, something about, uh, you know, these were serving under they had three leaders, but under those leaders, we had captains. You understand? Now, these captains uh, were re responsible. They, they, they had particular responsibilities that they had to serve. You understand? Now, now let's just, just read you something very, very important. Moreover, David, First Chronicles 25, verse 1. Moreover, David and the captains of the host separated to the service of the sons of Asaph. Now, what I was telling you that under the three leaders, under the three leaders, Asaph, Jebuthan, and Heman were what we call the captains of hosts. In other words, it was a large group. So under every leader, there were what we call captains of hosts who were supposed to lead others. You understand? So the Bible is telling us, moreover, David and the captains of the hosts separated with the service of, of the sons of Asaph, of Heman, and Jebuthan, who should prophesy with harp, with psalteries, with symbols, and the number of workmen according to service was. You understand? Why is he telling us that? It's because the music ministry has a prophetic part. It amplifies the message of Christ, which is preached in that ministry. That's why you see, Asaph has psalms where he was prophesying with a harp. 
Sons of Korah, the same thing were prophesying with a heart. You understand? Why? Because music ministry is beyond singing. It is amplifying the message ministered. It's bringing the prophetic, the heart of Christ, the testimony of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why I'm telling you that each of these three leaders had a representation. And these are what I call the distinct expressions of music. You understand? Because Heman means faithful. Asaf means collector or gatherer. And then Jebuthan means praising. You understand? What, what do those three mean? Now, this teaches us that music testifies of God's faithfulness in the name called Heman. You understand? Heman means faithfulness. So, music always teaches us God's faithfulness revealed in Christ. You understand? And so, when, 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 when this name, uh, because we have, we have Heman, which means faithful. We have Asaph, which means gatherer or collector. And then we have Jebuthan, which means praising. So it means that Asaph, to mean collector, music has the ability to draw or to collect men unto salvation. You understand? So Asaph teaches us that when we sing, we have the ability, music has the ability to send chords that tug men's hearts to Christ. So when they listen to the song, they want to know God. They want to know which God this one is. That's why men who have a relationship with God and are anointed and are established in the message of Christ, when they sing, their music can attract men to salvation. So Asaph would remind us that God wants to collect hearts of men to salvation. And finally, Jaduthan teaches us that we collect men in order to praise God continually. So let's put it this way. We are saying that the music ministry teaches us God's faithfulness in Christ. Revealed in the name. Haman. And then this music also gathers men to salvation in the name Asa. And this music after bringing men to salvation leads them to praise God continually. Revealed in the name Jeduthan. Hallelujah. You understand? And so for music ministers, you need to know that you have to learn to be faithful. Because he man taught us so. We must be faithful in understanding the word of God. We must be faithful to understand the pattern within a given ministry. Such that when we do, when we sing, we are not diverting from the message. We are singing the message. We are amplifying the message. You understand? Blessed be the name of the Lord. I remember 2 Chronicles 34 verse 12. You can write it down. 2 Chronicles 34 verse 12 where the Bible tells us, and the men did the work faithfully. Now, these were men who were serving in the temple. They did that work faithfully. And the overseers of them were Johath and Obadiah and the, Levi, the Levites, the sons of Merari, and Zechariah, Meshulam of the sons of Kohites to set it forward as to other Levites. All that could skill all that good skill of instrument of music. Now, he said that these men did their work faithfully. Their music ministers who turn to be unfaithful because they divert from the message. You understand? Because they diverted from the message, sometimes their relation, the quality of their relationship with God also is affected. And so they can produce chords and sounds that can bless people, chords and sounds that can gather men, that can reveal the faithfulness of God, that can lead men to praise God continually. So music within a given ministry must be understood by the musicians therein. You see that? Because music extends the influence of God's word within that given ministry. I've mentioned this again and again, that if you're a music minister, don't just sing whatever you want to sing. Don't! Sing the message. I said, sing the message. Sing the message. Sing the message. Now, on a personal level, the Bible teaches us, this is what I will really end with, that, you see, singing is not just for, in the New Testament especially, if you're born again, singing is not for a few people. The Bible will say, me, I'm not a music minister, so I can't sing. Now, let me tell you, if you're born again, the Bible expects you to be a singer. <laughs> because all of us have to sing to the Lord. Do you understand? And that's why you see, when you read Colossians 3.16, uh, of course, most of you know Colossians 3.16, but you can write now. 
Colossians 3 16, the Bible tells us that let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. He says, in all wisdom. Now, after saying in all wisdom, he says, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Let me tell you, one of the signs that God's word is working in you, in all wisdom, is when you're able to instruct others in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You understand? You, in other words, the revelation of God's word puts you at a place where you're able to show others how music works, how spiritual songs work. You must learn to sing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. You must learn to do it on a personal level. You wake up in the morning, wherever, whether you go in the bathroom. Some people love singing in the bathroom. I mean, I mean, it's okay. It's beautiful. Music extends the word of God, amplifies the word. You understand? You being born again means that you can release musical chords from your heart. You sing. You can make melodies. You can sing. The Bible says you can make melodies under the Lord. But you can also sing with grace in your heart. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Have you, have, you, have, you, have you wondered why? Have you asked yourself, okay, why? Most ministers, 99% of ministers you see on public, they may not be musicians. They may not have a gift. But do you know why they sing? It's because it's one of the ways of expressing the message. One of the ways of being filled with the Spirit. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So on a personal level, at least you must sing. Of course, in the New Testament, it doesn't mean everyone is gifted or wise, talented to sing or whatever. No. But it means everyone is a conduit of the message of Christ. Everyone is a vessel of the message. Do you understand? And so the message of God working in us, spiritual songs must flow out of us. Woo, glory to God. Hallelujah. <laughs> hell, hell, the land of Judah. How wonderful you are. I mean, I mean, if you, 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 you open your heart and, and express your heart, come on. Express your heart. Music isn't just about singing, but it's, it's, it's teaching, it's instructing, it's imparting revelation. Music ministers are teachers and preachers who extend the influence of God's word on a given altar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the quality of God's word you receive will define the quality of your music. You understand? And that's why it's important not just sing a song. You must recognize the lyrics in that song. It's very important because lyrics make a lot. So you see, the quality of the word you receive and the quality of your relationship with God will define the purity of the music, the power of the music that flows out of you, the frequency of the sound that comes out of the spirit to bless men, to reveal God's faithfulness, to collect men unto salvation, and to reveal the testimony of praising God forever. Just as I was sharing you from the name, uh, you know, uh, Heman to Asaph and to Jebethan to explain to you that music has an eternal testimony of the message of Christ. So child of God, go ahead and reveal, express your heart. Just to praise God through music. Yeah. Hallelujah. Don't say me, I, I have a bad voice.